Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our uh, seminar series here. And uh, before we do, just real quick, we do have events scheduled for every month. And uh, today we have uh, the X Factor, uh, creating the X Factor with technology. Uh, next month in March, the end of March, we have our designer, which will uh, be presenting on her secrets to selections. And then at the end of April, we will have a presentation on construction financing. Uh, so we will have those three events. And if you haven't signed up for our electronic newsletter, uh, go to our website and uh, sign up. And you can be kept abreast of all these uh, uh, seminars coming up. Uh, just a couple other couple things in the packet that I've got on the uh, table for you. There is a... Uh, a piece in there regarding our design discovery review, which will be in, uh, something we can explain later, and then also our project planning pack, which is helpful in this, uh, starting up a project and uh, getting a first uh, look at how you're going to get going on and uh, creating your project. So uh, with that, I am going to introduce our speaker for the night. Uh, Rick Aikens is... Uh, with Bright Life Incorporated, and he's going to talk about technology for the home. And uh, Rick, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself and, and what you're all about. All right, thank you very right, much. Thanks for uh, being here. Thank you. Okay. So as Bill said, I, uh, I'm the owner of Bright Life Technologies and been in the business of home technology integration for about 17 years. Um, we uh, wrote a book um, two years ago called Success with Home Technologies, and this is the current 2017 updated version. And what we're going to talk about today are some of the concepts from <clears throat> the book that, that hopefully will help people who are interested in doing new construction or remodeling uh, in the residential environment to be able to get the most uh, bang for the buck out of the technologies that they put into their homes. Um, so we do, we've done somewhere around 3,200 3, residences since 2000. So um, everybody asks me, you know, is it hard in our business because things always change on the technology side? And that's very true. Things, you know, when we started, it was mostly just putting some speakers in <clears throat> and running it off of uh, a CD player. And now, of course, we're all the way to the point where uh, nobody knows what a CD, my kids don't know what a CD <laughs> is anymore. Uh, so things do change over time, and part of our job is to make sure that the stuff you're investing in today is not obsolete within a year or two. So, so with that, we're going to, um, this is part of a very long, comprehensive uh, presentation. We only have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes today. And as we go, we'll be asking uh, <laughs> if anybody has questions, go ahead and ask as we're going through. We'll have some time at the end uh, for questions as well. So home technologies, what we always focus on are four areas. We want to improve the, uh, the home experience in terms of safety, uh, convenience, efficiency, and fun. Um, and what we're trying to get across uh, for convenience, for example, is to be able to control everything in your house from things that you already have in your hand most of the day, your cell phone, your iPad, and those type of things, and be able to control your home from anywhere in the world, which is very uh very straightforward to do these days. Um, efficiency, we deal with all kinds of uh, energy related um, issues such as motorized uh, window treatments so you can cut the heat and the glare down uh, from the sun uh, to lighting control where you're controlling the, um, the level of uh, energy usage for your uh, lights to irrigation control, pool and spa control. HVAC control. So a lot of things that we can tie together to make uh, the house as efficient as possible. And then what we're going to talk about today quite a bit is the fun factor um, because that's still the majority of what we do. You know, home theaters, audio systems, outdoor TVs, those type of um, areas that make the, the house and your living experience a little more fun. So these are some of the things that we do in a home. Uh, up in this area is our entertainment system. So Again, we call them uh, audio, video, and media solutions. <clears throat> uh, home theaters, golf and game simulators we'll talk just a little bit about today as well. Um, then we get into communication systems. So that's your networking in the house and your Wi-Fi. Um, this, even though 
it's a small part of our business. This is kind of the, the thing that everything else is built on these days, so we do spend a lot of time in that area. Uh, control systems we talked about just a bit, uh, but we'll get into a little on the HVAC control, uh, the lighting control. We do irrigation systems. We do uh, control for pools and spas because we've had a number of clients that have a outdoor you know hot tub and they roll the top over. We had one in Lake Forest that rolled the top over in um, or middle of October and they forgot about it and it stayed on and it stayed heated all the way through to March. So they were wondering where all their energy bills are going from. Uh, that's part of it. So we we do control those things. Um, and then safety, we're going to talk today just about the video camera section of that a little bit as we, um, when we get into the outdoor technologies. Part of the reason why this is important <clears throat> when you deal with an uh, architect like Bill is that we're part of that design and build uh, concept from the start these days. So just like you have to deal with your painters and your um, concrete people and your furniture people and uh, the flooring and so forth, um, pretty much every house at, at this stage needs a review on their technology package as well. And in the book, um, and we also have an online training course that we'll give some information about later, um, we go through these six steps. So everything from the initial design part of it, where we kind of figure out what you and your family want in the home and compare that with what's available and what's in, within budget, um, to us coming into the house during construction and doing the pre-wire, and then coming back after the walls are up and uh, trimming out all the devices and then all the way through to after you've moved in and everything's working how do we maintain that system and how do we make, uh, <clears throat> how do we work with you cost effectively for even simple things like batteries going dead or, or the fact that everybody's equipment rack gets very dusty after a couple of years so it's very important to keep that up to date so we're going to start with just a couple of slides on home networking. Um, the home network these days is absolutely critical for not just our systems, but you know, if the kids trying to, in my house, if, for example, four separate Netflix streams going <laughs> pretty much every night when the kids get back from school. Um, and occasionally, once in a while, actually doing homework on the network as well. Um, and then, of course, I'm like most entrepreneurs these days, you know, you're at home to whatever hour at night on your laptop trying to answer emails and do those type of things. And now on top of that, you're trying to throw uh, a, a whole house audio video system and cameras and control everything through your uh, smart device. Um, you need to have a really good network. Um, so a network is basically three parts. You have your network router, you've got switches and wireless access points. So the main thing is you're going to have uh, incoming service. Now the incoming service in my house is actually a hotspot on my phone these days. So this kind of is, is acting like what used to be called a modem. If you don't have that and you have it coming through somebody like AT&T or Comcast, they're going to provide a box, and that box is called a modem. Once the modem is uh, in place, you're going to take a cord from that modem most, most often into a router. And the router does several things, but one, it does... Uh, password protection on your system at a much higher level than the modems do. And it's kind of this situation where you, the modems are free, and that's basically what you're getting is something free, which doesn't do very much. It also provides um, a, uh, <clears throat> antivirus type capabilities. And the issue there is instead of allowing the virus to get on your computer, and then a couple days later you run your Norton you know, antivirus and it finds it and tries to scrub it clean, you're trying to get the router to. to bounce all those viruses out before it even gets to your devices. Wireless access points. Um, this has been changing recently in two, two different directions. Um, the first is that in the last few years everybody's gone to what's now called a dual band uh, system. The old system was 2.4 gigahertz. That's just the frequency at which the, uh, your computer talks to the network in the house. Um, the new one is 5 gigahertz. The faster the speed there, the faster the data is going to be coming you know, back and forth from your devices to your network. So you got to be fast to get to your network, then the network goes over Comcast or at and whoever is providing the network to the house, and that's as fast as your connection is going to be. Um, the, shorter, or the, the slower the system, though, the longer the, the distances that you can cover. 
So we do a dual band now because if you're close to the system, you want to hook up as fast as possible through your five gigahertz. But if you're out by the pool and you don't have a wireless access point out there, um, or you're just walking around the house, you want to be able to uh, hit very long distances if you need to. Also, there are dedicated outdoor wireless access points now, which are weatherproof, and we definitely recommend that. A lot of our clients have fairly large uh, homes, or they just have a home where the exterior uh, building material is not conducive for uh, the transmission of wireless data. So we can put an outdoor wireless access point and cover the whole backyard, and now you've got all that access uh, for, for everything from... Uh, watching uh, a movie out in your backyard to listening to music and so forth. So, very important part to consider. You can also add what's called a wireless access controller. And a controller basically means I walk into the house and my front door, my phone sees the most powerful wireless access point and, and attaches to it. And now I walk up to my bedroom and as I'm walking, this phone's not switching from that first access point. So now all of a sudden I'm 80 feet away Oh, and everything's slowing down. And it's going to slow down until it drops completely, and then the phone's going to try to look for the, the next closest wireless access point. So a controller basically means as you walk through the house, it's saying this one is more powerful than the wireless access point upstairs, but at some point it's going to switch that over, and it's automatically going to switch to the more powerful wireless access point. The new systems, which I don't have on the, <coughs> on the uh, slide yet, it's not new, meaning better, just a different way to make the system work. It's called a, a mesh network, where the first wireless access point broadcasts all the ones around it, and everything that can hear it receives that data and then broadcasts it out again, and you just build this big mesh in your house. And it's got some, some benefits to it, uh, uh, mainly that if you forgot um, uh, to cover one part of the house, you can just add another piece and expand the network a little bit faster. But with any mesh network, there is some uh, some uh, slowdown in the performance because you don't know exactly what path you're going to take to get out uh, to the network. So these are these are some of the considerations when you talk about doing uh, a, a professional Wi-Fi system in the house. And the other thing to consider is. When you go to a Starbucks or you go to a Panera or something like that, um, or you're on a, even a train or a bus, um, you, you and your you know, 50 closest friends are there, <laughs> all with phones, all with laptops, all with, you know, half of them are with tablets, the other half have something on their, on their wrist um, that's a smart device, and these Wi-Fi systems have to be able to take 50 or 100 individual devices and, and make it work. And now you're getting to the point where in your house you've got the same thing. Because now every TV is hooked up to the Wi-Fi network, all your Blu-ray players are hooked up to the network, all of your laptops, and then your kids, of course, they probably have 10 or 12 different devices each as it, as it goes. So just keep that in mind. It's a very important part of uh, it. will make your life a lot nicer in your home if you have a good system. Um, next area we're going to talk about, this one we'll get into a little more detail are the entertainment systems in the house. And what we're talking about is the media room uh, design that's more, not, not necessarily a dedicated home theater, but just a surround sound system with a nice TV or projector. Uh, we'll talk about some of the details for a whole house audio and video system. And then we're gonna talk about the, the most, uh, the fastest growing part of our business, which are the outdoor audio video systems. So when you get into, um, a multi-zone system, it's basically or a media room. There's basically two main issues, the audio and the video. So the audio is going to be a surround sound system, and that's the biggest difference. And if you haven't had a surround sound system, um, there's two main benefits to it. The first is there's a, a speaker like this, whether it's a box speaker on a cabinet or this one that goes flush in the wall. Um, there's one speaker that's right above the TV or below the TV, but in line with the television, and that's... Um, supposed to be, it's called a center channel, and that's where all the dialogue comes from. So as you get older, like we all do, and you're trying to listen to the two little speakers on the TV, they're taking all the dialogue and they're bleeding it into the two speakers that also have to carry the soundtrack, all the explosions, the music, everything else. So that's why it gets hard to hear sometimes. So instead, you have a center channel 
and when the two people are right there talking, you're going to hear that right through the, the center channel. And you can turn that channel up separate from the rest of the speakers if you want to. Um, the second thing the surround sound does, and why it's called surround sound, is that you're going to be sitting here, and there's two speakers behind you or to the side, and there's two speakers up front in the corners, and those four surround you with sound. And the whole idea is you're watching the movie, and that car chase starts behind you, and the car <coughs> you know, flies by you, and then makes a hard right and comes across the front, you're going to hear it from this speaker first and then that speaker and then that speaker. So it gives you a whole whole new flavor for the sound. And, and if you love movies, every every theater has surround sound, and it has for quite a while. So this is bringing that, that entertainment back to your house in that same quality. The other part is this uh, subwoofer. So no matter what speaker you have, especially the little speakers that come in, the TV, there's a, there's a little, um, what's called a driver, like this, that's called a, a woofer. And that's the, the deep, um, low sounds that you have. You know, the rumble and so forth. The big explosion that happens, or the bass drum when you're listening to music. So these are typically six inches wide, seven inches wide, or eight inches wide. And they, they're only designed to kick out so much um, vibration. And the, the smaller those are, I should say the other way. The bigger those are, the wider they are, typically the deeper the sound can be. So these speakers on the TV and even the surround sound speakers don't give you a lot of bass. And that's not just important for movies. It's important, especially if you listen to rock and roll music, because there's so much, you know, the bass guitar and the, and the, the bass drums and everything else, you got a lot of low frequency sound that you want to listen to. So the that, what... A surround sound system is called a 5.1 system, so the five speakers that go around you, and the dot one is the subwoofer. So, a couple things that uh, you may want to look out for. A lot of our homes, the main media room is in the gray room. And a lot of times the gray room has the fireplace as the centerpiece and windows on both sides, and, or doors below that. So a lot of times you're not going to be able to put uh, your left and right speakers in the wall. So instead of doing that, we can we have an option to do what's called a soundbar. So the soundbar goes underneath the TV, uh, whether it's mounted to the television, like it would be across here, or if the TV's flat on the wall, it might get mounted straight to the wall. But you have a left speaker, a center speaker, and a right speaker in that one um, cabinet. So the trade-off is this may be the only way you can fit it on your in your room, and it does it does sound pretty pretty good. But the trade-off is these speakers are so close together, you don't really get the spatial feel for you would, what you optimally would want in a home theater or media room. So this, the sound of the car scooting by, you know, all that's kind of contained right in front of you in this. In this. So you have three separate channels, so you're going to hear the three separate things. And you have a separate center channel, so you can still bump up the dialogue. But um, this is a great solution if you have to go that route. So a subwoofer, there's two types of subwoofers that we use. Uh, traditionally they've been boxes, big boxes like this. Um, and you can see on this, this might be 12 or 14 inch uh, cube. The ones we we do have some that are really small, they're, they're as small as a 9 inch cube, if you have to have them that way. And they do kick out, they still kick out a lot of power, but they, they can't get real deep like this one, this is a 12 inch uh, woofer, you know, driver. Um, so you can get very, very deep sounds with something like that. These are a little less expensive than a comparable subwoofer that would be in the wall because the amplifier is built right into this. An in wall or an in ceiling subwoofer, you have a separate amplifier back at the equipment rack. So the combination is always a little more expensive than this. The trade off is that this is in your room. You know, taking up floor space, you have cord, you've got all that. So, um, so percentage-wise, more of our systems have in-wall subwoofers, sometimes in-ceiling subwoofers if they, they don't have the wall space. Um, the one caveat with a ceiling subwoofer, if you go that route, because it cleans up the walls and, you know, you don't have a problem with that. You do have a problem, though, if the master bedroom is right above the gray room. <laughs> yeah. And the subwoofer is kicking out the base all night long, especially when your kids are down there playing video games. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, yeah, so that was that. Don't use an in-wall subwoofer if you've got a, a, uh, a room above it. 
Also, be careful if you use an in-wall subwoofer, if you're doing that in an exterior wall for the house. A lot of times, you know, you got it fill it fills the whole two by four gap, and if you're either you've got blown it uh, the hard installation, you can't cut into that. If it's not the hard installation, you still have the problem that you're going right from the outside cold right into this woofer, and it's going to pass into the house uh, to some extent. Now we'll talk about the video side. Um, what we're going to focus on is that most of our clients don't want to have all the uh, electronics visible, and they don't even want to have the electronics in the in the great room in a cabinet because the cabinet uh, give limited cabinet space to start with. Plus, the equipment is fairly deep, so now you have to build the cabinets a little bit deeper, and the the equipment gets hot. So now you have the we have had clients unfortunately that they live with the doors of their cabinets that they spend all that money for wide open. So that's some of the things that are important to keep in mind is if you put all of your equipment outside of the room, and typically we have a rack uh, that we put in the basement where all the equipment goes, because um, you don't need access to the equipment. All of your control is coming right from your phone, so you never have to even touch the equipment. But we run a network cable from the equipment up to um, behind the TV, and then you get a, a box similar to this behind the TV. This is called a Balan, um, because um, today all, all uh, video runs over what's called HDMI cable. So it's a digital cable, it's got a little rectangular he uh, head on it, and that would plug in this side. Um, the network cable coming from your equipment plugs in the other side, and then um, the HDMI plugs into the TV. And that's how you get the video back and forth. It's a little more expensive to do it this way, but we do it across the board because if you run an HDMI cable, you can only go really up to about 50 feet, which isn't that far when you're doing new construction. Um, the second issue is if you damage the cable, there's no way to fix it in the field. So if we run a network cable and that network cable gets dinged during construction, we just cut the end off, put a new plug on, and we're ready to go. Um, also, in the future, we've already seen HDMI go from uh, 1080p, uh, uh, which is high definition, uh, to 4K, which is where we're at now, and now people are already building 8K video. So it's, it's going to keep going uh, higher and higher bandwidth, and we can run all that bandwidth over uh, Ethernet cable. We may not be able to run it uh, that length on an HDMI cable, or the specs will change, and the, the wire you already have in the wall may not work anymore. Are there any questions as we go? Let me know. Yeah, I do have one question. Yeah. How do you future proof? Because as you say, things are constantly changing. So, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you protect yourself from So I mean, can you put in and I think we've done this before, is put in conduits or like P V C pipe chases so that you can run a different type of wire at least. Yeah. So the, parts of the house. there's three main ways you pr we pr uh, future proof a system. One is we, we don't run just one network cable, we run multiple network cables. And, and what happened was when HDMI first got started, you, you could not run a balun like this on a single cable, they ran it on two cables. So you had to have two cap, what we call category five or category six network cables. And it basically split that high bandwidth between two wires and now it could carry all the data. So if we had, we usually run three, so that in the future, if you need, all of a sudden you go, um, from one bandwidth to a much higher bandwidth, we should be able to make it work with those multiple cables. The second is you could run fiber optic cable at this point. This fiber optic cable can, can handle 10 times the bandwidth of a copper cable. So we can run that even if we don't spend the money to terminate the ends, at least you have the wire in place at this point. And the third way is to do what you said, where you run a corrugated tube um, from the head ends or from a wall location up to behind the TV and then you can pull wire through that later if you need to upgrade things. The, the downside with that is, you know, it's a couple couple dollars a feet perhaps to, to run that conduit. So it does get a little expensive to do it that way. Um, the fiber optic cable, is that's the ultimate future proof because you can't, there's no, no transmission media that's faster than that. Um, and what happens is if you think about the way that this, this is a high definition TV, so it's got a certain amount of pixels this way and a certain amount of pixels this way. So it's got 10,080 pixels one way, um, <clears throat> and that's why it's called 1080p. Well, the next one up is 4K. 4K is 
twice as many this way and twice as many that way. So multiply two by two, you get eight, right? Or you get four. So there's four times as much data coming through than we needed just a couple years ago when we switched from 1080p high definition to ultra high definition, which is 4K. 8K is going to be two times more this way, two times more that way. So now we're 16 times more data. So that's how it's going to bounce up really quick. And uh, so I'm not sure what they're going to send over all that data because <laughs> high definition, you could basically see a person's whiskers, you know, in close up. 4K, you could watch the whiskers grow on <laughs> close up. So I'm not sure what they're going to do in 4K uh, or in 8K, 8K and beyond. That's, yeah. been a, that's going to be scary. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's an important uh, thing is how to prevent yourself from having to rip open the walls later is to think about these things as you go. And then in the book, um, we have what's called a, our bucket list. So and we have a more extensive one that is a downloadable uh, feature from the website that, where we have our um, training program on. Um, and part of that is you'll get some, just some general budgetary numbers on different areas. So when you talk about a media room, you know, all the wiring, the video and the audio wiring, you're probably talking somewhere around $500. Um, the HDMI balun, <clears throat> that's for a transmit balun at one end and a receive balun at the TV end. That set is going to be somewhere around $450. Um, the surround sound receiver, tip, the one we use most often, probably 80% of the time, is around $1,200. Um, control system, that's your, that's your remote control and, and, or, and or the system that goes on the phone. Um, the speakers and a, a TV, like a 65-inch 4K TV right now is somewhere in the $3,000 range. So, I mean, it's, the prices are coming down. The new TVs we'll talk about in a little bit are called OLED TVs, O-L-E-D. Um, and those, um, we'll talk about what the benefits are uh, later, but even those um, started about t maybe 50% higher than a standard uh, LED TV. And already the prices are coming way down. So, so we try to get this kind of information up front. So as you start your design process with your architect, um, at least you've got something in mind as far as your budget so things aren't a big surprise later on. Um, almost everybody we work with have uh, multi-zone audio and video systems. And basically what it means is you can put all your equipment, uh, we're doing a job in downtown Chicago right now where they have eight TVs and they have three cable boxes and the three cable boxes are not attached to TVs that are at an equipment rack. So they can go into any room and say, I want to watch cable, cable box number one. I want to listen to cable box number one through my nice over, overhead speakers. And they can go to the next room and say, I want to watch Cable Box 1. And they can, you know, in Chicago, watch the Bears beat the Packers every, on every TV in the house. Good Someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's, what, um, that's what we're trying to get accomplished here, is whatever room you're in, you know, you can jump onto your Pandora account and listen to your favorite music. Um, we usually ban country western music on our systems, but you can override that if you need to. Um, but we can, we can provide this uh, pretty much throughout the house, inside the house and outside the house. And every family member can access their own music preferences. Um, it's just a matter of how many sources that we put into the system. And every room has independent volume control. So you can, again, uh, make the house much more livable. And on top of that, you don't have to walk around with earbuds stuck in your head all day long. And there's a bunch of different uh, speaker designs, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, that meet the needs of basically every room in the house. The other thing is, a lot of people have, I have uh, Spotify and Pandora and Amazon Music on my phone, uh, which I port to my car stereo. But when I'm at home, I'm on my phone, so the multi-zone system makes it a lot easier to still listen to your music while you're on the phone doing whatever else you want to do. Or if you leave the house, your music library is still available. The standard speaker looks like this. And this whole thing gets put into the, into the drywall. Um, you typically right about the time it gets painted. And then there's a grill that fills the middle part up. And it's got this big rim around the outside. And the reason for the big rim is that drywallers, anybody, has a problem cutting a, a good circle. So it's always got imperfections behind that. And this rim is designed to to cover that. 
So the new ones have very thin rims. This is the, the grill for one of the new speakers that we use. Virtually all the speaker brands that we use have this design now. And what happens is, if you imagine this is put into the wall or into the ceiling, either one, and it's got a bunch of magnets around the outside, and this covers this whole thing. Um, because of that, <coughs> the grill is very, very flat to the ceiling. And the grill is also much easier to get that speaker out if you have to, because you just pull off the grill from the magnets, and then you have your screws here, you can take the speaker out, whereas this was much harder. And you had a lot of times where the speakers would get painted onto the wall, onto the wall and it was made it very difficult to work with. So this is the new style that's out there. Very thin rims, very flat to the surface. Everything's paintable, so if you want to match a wall color, you can do that as well. There are also ones called uh, architectural speakers. They have no rim at all. And what happens is you get a, a piece of um, a wood about this big, uh, a, a back plane, and it's got a professional, like a, um, a manufactured uh, speaker hole in it. So it's a perfectly circle or perfect square, whatever size or the shape that you want. And then that gets mounted against the studs or the joist before drywall. The drywallers butt up their drywall to it the whole thing gets uh, mudded and sanded down, so it's part of the structure at that point. Then the speaker gets put in afterwards, so there's a perfect mud, perfect rim around it, and the speaker itself is perfectly flush with the ceiling or the wall. Um, and we have that similar design for everything, pretty much everything in the wall. Uh, HVAC vents, uh, light switches, keypads, pretty much everything. You also have hidden speakers now. So we can put a speaker right into the wall. It gets painted just like part of the wall and you turn it on and you've got your speakers without having to see anything. And the new styles are much, much, uh, the sound quality is much better than it has been in the past. Just be careful, a lot of our clients want to do that in the dining room because they don't want to see speakers in the dining room. And they don't want to have speakers in the ceiling necessarily because it's going to be right above one of the people at the table, so it's kind of annoying. So a lot of times I'll put them in the wall or even down low on the wall. Um, our warning is always if you do the wall, just make sure you remember it's there because you don't want to put a picture frame nail through it. Some of the thing, oddball things we've done that actually work, have worked really well is sometimes we'll have an unfinished basement. There's nowhere in the room to put the speaker. So we just hang it or we screw it into the joist below the, the uh, room and then have the carpenter cut out a fake HVAC grill and just put the grill on there. So people walk into the room, there's nothing visible there, um, but they turn on the music and the sound comes up through the uh, HVAC vents and it sounds great. Um, they come in, uh, speakers come in a couple of uh, specific um, uh, designs. <clears throat> so a lot of speakers are what's called a two-channel design. So you would have uh, the big part behind here is the woofer, and you would just have one of these, which would be the, the, twi the tweeter, which is the high frequency. Um, this is a three-way design. So you have, a, you have a tweeter, you have a mid-range, and you have a uh, woofer. So what you want to do is to um, consider what the client wants in their home. If they're really an audiophile and they listen especially to things like classical music, you want to have a good mid-range because you've got everything from the flute at the top to the, you know, to the tuba at the bottom, but you've got a lot of music, uh, musical instruments that are in the middle range, um, and this is going to make it sound that much better. If you listen to rock and roll, it's usually lead guitar, high pitch, and low pitch with the bass guitar and the drum, right? So you don't really need that necessarily, but so you just got to kind of think through what kind of music you really enjoy the, the most. You also have specific speakers. This is called a single stereo speaker. So you have the woofer in the back, but you have the left and right channel in one cutout. So you have a left, and when you listen to stereo, the idea is you have a left speaker on one side, a right speaker on the other side. That's ideal. But if you're in a bathroom, you don't have a lot of ceiling space or a kitchen. You don't want to cut open a bunch of holes. You can do a single stereo speaker. It's a little less expensive, and it, it you know cuts down on the ceiling clutter. And we also have all of these in designs that are uh, specifically made for bathrooms and steam showers. You can put a speaker right into a steam shower if you want to. 
this is brand new and this is a very high end system that sounds incredible. Um, basically, you're looking at a bunch of little round ceiling lights and you have small little speakers about this size with the little covers on the front. And then those are spread throughout the, the um, living space. And then you have a subwoofer that goes in the wall or in the ceiling and kicks out all the bass from the top because these speakers are too small for the bass. The idea with this is you, if you're having a party, you don't want one big speaker here loud so that the people in between the speakers can hear and another big one at the other end. So this allows you to have a very comfortable level of really high quality sound throughout the whole listening space. And then the subwoofer, when you kick that on, it just fills the whole sound. It sounds much, much better. So probably not for every room, but public areas, you know, the big areas mm -hmm. that um, you're going to have parties and, and a lot of people moving around, this is a great solution. And then we do, on the TV side, we, we do a lot of wow factor stuff. We do mirror TVs, quite a few mirror TVs. And the biggest areas there are bathrooms <clears throat> or if you have a fireplace and you want, you don't want to necessarily have everybody know that that's your TV. You have a mirror over the, you know, a big mirror over a 65 inch TV. It looks like a real mirror, not a one way smoked glass mirror like they used to have. And then you turn on the television and now you're watching TV. So that's a great solution for bathrooms or for uh, big living room areas. Does that require any kind of a special TV or does that work with pretty much any TV? Um, because it, it, um, the TV and the mirror are one piece, so oh, okay. it's the same same manufacturer. Okay. But that's th that allows them to use the one glass for everything, you know. So it's not a separate TV screwed into the back with a one-way mirror on it. Because when you do that, then the mirror doesn't look good. It looks gold instead of silver. You know, it's just not a good not a good look. So that's a specialty. Yeah. Manufactured um, screen. Yeah. The TV screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do what's called window or window walls or video walls. So this is a situation with the video wall where they have three TVs going up and three TVs going side to side. The 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 grill or the separation in between is only two tenths of an inch, so you can barely you know when you're back a ways, you can see one picture over all nine screens if you want to, or you can divide it up like you see here for multiple TVs. Um, and this is really good too for video game players. You know, if you have your kids and you've got four separate um, screens playing, you know, um, their video at the same time, it's a really good solution for that. Um, there's a picture going around our industry last year with <coughs> the dad and his kid playing video games, and they're watching their TV, and the kids, lay, you know, sitting behind, in front of the couch between the, the dad's legs, and the dad's playing on the top part of the screen and the kids playing on the bottom part of the screen, and this dad, brilliant idea, which I, because I, I get killed by my kids on video games. Sure. Um, he literally took a piece of cardboard, taped it to his kid's head, and went all the way to the screen, right where, right in the middle, so his kid can't see where he's going, or where he's shooting at, because <laughs> the kids cheat all the time. So this is a really nice uh, uh, system. We also can do this just with software now. So we have projectors. It's a separate piece that divides that screen up two by two, but it's one. You know, it's just one, um, one project projector yes. onto a screen. So you're not you don't have, you don't have any separation in between there. Um, the other nice thing with the TV video walls now is this color red and that color red are exactly the same color red. You know, the video processor is in there. It's a straight line. Everything looks great. If the basketball bounces from here over to here, it's going to go smooth across, and it's going to look like the same color throughout the, the uh, three screens. We're also putting one of these in at one of our clients downtown, so we can, in their case, on one side of the room is a surround sound for their living room. On the other side of the room <coughs> is a surround sound for their sitting room. But they only want to have one TV because... When the TV's shooting the other way, they, they have a real nice piece of artwork in the sitting room. And then if they're in the sitting room, they just hit a button on their on their phone, and the TV spins 180 degrees. Now the, the back is showing the um, you know the painting to the living room side, but then the, the sound system on the sitting room side kicks in. So we can do that. Um, this is another thing where this type of video wall 
uh, construction can be used. This is actually coming around a corner, and then you can turn that into any kind of artwork that you want. We have people that, you know, you, this vendor at least, I, we haven't personally done this one, but you walk up the stairs to the second floor, and all along the, the walls coming up, and then the railing, you know, for the second floor landing, uh, that looks down on their gray room. They have TVs all through there, so they can change the colors and everything as they go. So, and this is really good if you are in the condo downtown and you really wanted to have the penthouse condo facing the lake, but you're stuck in the first floor condo facing the parking lot. You can put this and then pretend that you're <coughs> facing the lake during the. We were down there today at the lake, and it's blue skies and beautiful out. And your heart just went, oh, this is awesome. We were 36 stories up and uh, looking over the, the aquarium. And then by 12 o'clock, it was gray. And, <laughs> you know, the temperature was dropping 20 degrees. And so this can really brighten your life. Yeah, turn the, turn the screen up. In shower uh, TVs now. So this is a mirror TV like the other one, but it's designed to go in a shower. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> An in-shower <laughs> shower. <laughs> Speaker with an in shower TV. I would not have to go anywhere yeah. except for my pizza. It's perfect. <laughs> um, that TV can also go behind a backsplash. Now you're in the kitchen and nobody knows where to put TV, TVs anymore because you don't want to take your counter space. You, you can't do a flip down because the cabinets, are, the TVs are too big, right? Your, your cabinets don't stick out far enough. You have two choices you have a drop down motor or you put it in a backsplash. So that, that's a, another great solution for you if. Uh, you know, for the right client. We also have um, motorized screens. So we have drop-down screens like this that can come out of the ceiling. We also have flip-down screens that come down this way. So when they're not on, they're, they're flush to the ceiling. We have drop-down and then spin TVs. So you can do that way if, like, you're in bed, but you have a little sitting area over here, you can spin it towards you so you can listen or watch the TV that way. Um, so we've got these, and you can do these both indoors and outdoors. So if we have one downtown right now, we're in a planter box. We reverse this and we put the TV in the planter box and then the TV pops up. You can watch your TV and then, you know, and it's out, an outdoor TV that we never have to take inside. So it's, it's perfect. And then what everybody needs for Christmas, the under bed TV left. <laughs> so the TV folds down and rolls under the bed when you're not watching it. Folds, comes out, rolls up vertical, and then pops up from there. So you're, you know, you're not having to crane your neck. It's right there in front of you at the foot of the bed. It's a great solution. Everybody needs one. I can't use it because I have socks and all kinds of stuff down here all the time. But most normal people, this is a great solution. And we have operators standing by for orders. Right now, <laughs> Outdoor audio video is probably the fastest growing part of our business along with the motorized shades. Um, a couple things, this is the typical way that people used to use uh, outdoor audio. They take a box speaker like this, they mount it to the wall, and they shoot it out from the house into the yard. Not real aesthetic, and they point away from the house and right to your neighbors. So a couple <laughs> small problems there. To get around that, we took the speakers for a while and we put them under rocks and we put them into planters and we put them out around the sitting area. And those were actually were fairly decent after a while. Um, I had some of these myself and the, the rock looked like a rock even a couple years later, even though it's basically styrofoam painted. Um, but they, it, it worked to a point. So now we've come out with what's called landscape audio. And it's two major parts. And it overcomes three problems. The first one is that any of those small speakers, um, because you're filling the outdoors, it's a kind of a big space, sounds tinny because you can't get enough bass out there. So instead, what we do now is we take the ground level here and we bury a big subwoofer kettle into the ground. So this is the subwoofer. All that sticks out from it from the ground is that little mushroom mushroom cap, and it rocks. I mean, I hate to be the worms down there because it's, <laughs> it's shaken. So that's a way to, to get around that issue. Second issue is, both from a static point of view and protecting your, your livelihood with your neighbors, you have these garden speakers. They look kind of like up lights now, but they're designed to either, like this one, to mount onto a tree 
pointing back to your sitting area, or in the landscape out here, pointing to your to your sitting area. They look a lot like the landscape lighting, and your neighbors continue to be your friends because you're sitting here, all the sun's coming to you, not out to the out to your neighbors. And when we're in the outdoor environment, um, we do Wi-Fi outside, which we talked about already. We do lighting control outside, we'll talk about just a little bit later. And um, we also, in that area, we do a lot of video cameras uh, for security purposes. So the outdoor cameras, won't, we don't have time to get into a lot of the detail today. Um, but almost all of them are like this camera now where it's internet-based and you can see everything right on your, on your phone including cameras at your front door. So a lot of people know that now there's companies out there we use, like Ring. Um, we use one, a competitor there's most often called Doorbird. But if somebody rings the doorbell, you get a chirp on your phone, you look down and there's, you can see the person up front, you can talk to them. You, if you have an electric latch, you can release the latch remotely. Uh, outdoor video, so we do outdoor TVs, you don't have to take them in. A couple things to be careful about. They can go down to 100. Uh, they can go down to minus 30 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and up to 130 degrees. So, pretty much never have to take them in. They do pretty much require a dust cover though, because they they will get dirty pretty quick, and you don't want a bunch of bird droppings on your uh, outdoor TV. Uh, but the other design criteria they want to talk to your architect about, especially, is where you want that outdoor TV. How does that compare to where the sun's going to be shining? Because if you have a TV and you've designed your outdoor patio um, so that your back is to the west, and now the whole time you're watching TV in the afternoon, that, TV, that sun is shining right on the TV, that could be a problem. Um, so what we can do is we, we're just doing one of these now. This is the one. This isn't the job, but um, very similar with a pergola, with a, a pop-up TV over here. We all the outdoor TV manufacturers have an ultra bright um, option. So the ultra bright TV, if you're facing south or west especially, you want the ultra bright. It's a little more expensive, but you'll be able to see it with direct sunlight on the TV. The second thing is we have um, vertical screens, that we can, motorized screens we can put in, and we also have um, uh, motorized awnings that we can go back and forth on our track below the, the uh, pergola. So if you, especially, in the summer, it's too hot even to stand out there to, or sit out there to watch TV. You can just, with a button push, have this awning come across and give you some shade and also some shade for the TV. We can also, with that pergola design, we've also put it in where we have a motorized theater screen at the one end going up and down with a projector shooting on. The projectors, typically, you would want to take those in unless you can put it in a box that's completely weatherproof. But the, the screen you can keep outside pretty much uh, year-round. And the one warning is people, they, you see these advertisements in magazines for these floating pool um, screens. And it looks like such a great idea. You're floating out there on your little floaty, and there's this projector screen right in front of you, and you're watching Star Wars on it. But what they don't show you in the, the still shot is that everybody's bobbing out of the waves. <laughs> and the screen is doing this back and forth and turning and so that's probably not the best idea in the world if you're going to do that put a motorized screen at the end of your pool and pop it up when you want to watch something and we can, we have screens that you actually put the projector on the back side shooting at the screen from behind and so you don't have to shoot it all the way across the pool you know if you want to do something like that home theaters um, I'm not going to go through a lot of this because of time considerations um, but a home theater, we can do it in a dedicated room um, with any kind of combination of, of uh, attributes to it. You, this is showing a starlit um, ceiling, and there's a little color wheel that goes in there, so the, the lights are actually twinkling like stars. We have these are um, acoustic panels on the side to make it sound better, but you can also do custom screen printing on those. So we have a person. Uh, the, this manufacturer had a client up in Wisconsin that had uh, season tickets for the Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field and took pictures all the way around what it looks like from his seat. And they'd make, put all these panels up so it looks like he's 
mm -hmm. in this seat. Um, and then we can do theater chairs and all kinds of different things. This is uh, what's called a semi-custom uh, theater design, where all this comes as a prefab package, and we bring it out and we you know put everything together to reduce the cost from a truly custom home theater. So there's there there's systems like that that can be pretty cost effective. And then we can turn that theater into a golf simulator or a game simulator. Um, so the seats are back here, a couple tiers of seats, so you can still use that for playing video games or watching movies, so it's a multi-purpose room. But you can see here it's also a golf simulator. Some of the new golf simulators, the way that they track the ball, allows them to also do other games. So you can, you know, if your kids are soccer players, you can have them practice kicking the soccer ball into the screen, and it'll show them just like kick, you know, hitting a golf ball. Or you could have tee ball, you could have uh, you know, a number of different um, darts, a number, a number of different games that way. And it just turns that room into more than just the golfer's room in the house. And we'll just talk a little bit about light control and then we'll open up for questions because um, we're running out of time as it is. Um, Lighting control, the main uh, reasons to do it is it does improve energy efficiency because all your lights are, are using less energy because <clears throat> you pre-program them uh, at a, a cooler level. And because the lights don't burn as hot, you can extend bulb life. Now this is a bigger issue back when everything was incandescent lights, but um, you can still save money on LEDs or other lights. Now, they don't take as much to start with, but it's still a benefit. Um, even with LED lights, though, safety is the big issue. So you don't come home to a dark house. You know, you can turn your lights on either automatically at a certain time of day or as you're driving home from your phone. Um, all the systems have an astronomical clock, so it's not just turn on the lights at 10 o'clock. It's maybe turn on the lights to 20% 30 minutes before sunset every day, and it, the system tracks that throughout the year. And you can set up multiple things. You can say, I want my outdoor lights at 20% half hour before sunset every day. I want them then to turn on to 50% until midnight, then down to 10% at midnight, and maybe turn some of them off. And then when I get ready to go to school or to work, I want to turn back on again for 20 minutes before sunrise. So you can get some pretty detailed, um, pretty detailed programming. And that adds convenience because... We all are parents that have kids that go downstairs and leave all the lights on every night. So we, I don't want to walk throughout the house and turn off all the lights. Um, so you can do that from your phone at the end of the night if you want to. And then you can create ambiance in your rooms by a single button push. Instead of going to six different dimmers and going, oh, I think this is how I like it for dinner, you just you pre-program that and hit one button, it says dinner, and then everything does what it's supposed to do. So those are... Some of the benefits for lighting control. In motorized shades, the main two uh, benefits for motorized shades is uh, it reduces the heat coming into the house and it'll reduce the glare in the home from the sunlight. And the glare meaning glare off of the television, but also the light that bleaches your floors and bleaches your, your fabrics on your couch and those type of things. Um, so it protects both your fabrics and your floors, and it greatly improves your privacy in the house. So we have shades that allow you to still see the light coming from the top, but they're bottom-up shades, so they'll rise up to whatever level to give you privacy. We have shades that um, most of our clients want these shades <clears throat> on the windows that are behind their jacuzzi tub because they're getting into the tub. They don't want to have to jump in the tub fully clothed and pull all the shades down and then jump out to get ready for their bath. Um, and then... Areas that are very hard to get to, like the great room that might have a second floor uh, set of windows, um, and the light invariably comes in right when you're watching TV, right into your face, you want to be able to raise and lower those shades if, as needed. And we're not going to go through this just for time issues, other than a lot of our systems uh, can be done radio frequency including the shades. So you don't have to run wire to your light switches, and you don't have to run wire to your shades, because the shades can all be battery operated now. And then we just use your phone and say, drop the shades in my gray room, and all shades go down. Um, we're going to stop there just for time issues, but are there any questions over what we've covered so far? All right.
No questions. All right. <laughs> Covered it good. All so right. Well, it. Uh, Rick, appreciate you coming by sure. and doing the presentation Absolutely. here tonight. And, uh, you know, especially what you're talking about with motorized shades and such, that's a place where the pre-planning can really come in. Yeah. In well because you can get that wiring in place even if you don't do shades immediately because who doesn't have the budget to do everything right, they want right, initially right. but doing the pre-wire I think makes a lot of sense for people yeah. so it's something they should really think through what they're planning to do and and make it work so again I appreciate you uh, giving the presentation everybody and uh, we will uh, do another one again next month that sounds good appreciate it All right. All right. take care